job, Brandon? Matthew, not too shabby. <laughs> awesome. All right, so if you have your Bibles, look with me in Ephesians chapter 4. So for the past few weeks, we've been talking about how last year our church celebrated its sesquicentennial. That's 150 years for those of you who are counting. And for over a century and a half, this church has had an important uh, mission on the coastal bend. And while our church has changed quite a bit over the past 150 years, uh, one thing has not changed, and that is our mission. And so every few years, I preach a series of sermons on our church's mission, and I invite you uh, to recommit yourself to what we believe God has called us to do. And uh, I am trying to express my belief that God has an important place for us in our community and in one another's lives and beyond this community. So... We are wanting to participate in God's purposes for us in the days to come as we work to accomplish God's mission. So what is the mission of our church? By now you should have this memorized. But the mission of First Baptist Rockport is to lead all people to be shaped by the love of Christ. Have you heard that before? Yes. And it's on the screens. So... How do we know when we are accomplishing our mission? Well, here we say that we will know that Christ is shaping us with his love when we make disciples who do five things. Worship the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Disciples will connect with other believers in a local church. They will grow in Christ's likeness. They will serve God and others. And they will reach out to a lost world with the love of Christ. And so every week I've taken one of these things and uh, tried to unpack it and apply it to our lives. Uh, in a few years, you'll probably get all these sermons again. Isn't that exciting? Yes. But you won't remember, and so it'll be great. <laughs> so today we're talking about growing. And it's important for us to ask a series of questions, and I think the text are, is going to answer these questions. And so we want to know, when we talk about growth in the Christian life, what exactly are we talking about? Then we want to know, why is this even necessary? Why is growth a necessary part of my Christian life? And then finally, how can it happen? How does growth happen in our lives? So, let's read the text. Ephesians 4, I'm going to start reading in verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does, it, does its work. All right, so again, three big questions. What is growth when we talk about that in the Christian life? Secondly, why is this such a big deal? And then third, uh, how does it happen if it happens at all? So I'm going to answer all three of those things this morning, and then your life group teachers can straighten out everything that I messed up this morning. So here's the first thing. Growth is the process church members experience together in which God moves them toward maturity in Christ. It's the process that church members experience together 
in which God moves them towards maturity in Christ. And that word that's used in the text for mature is an important word for the Apostle Paul and throughout the New Testament. It has the idea of being fully developed or full grown, or you could use the word ripe. Are you ripe? So, it, it, the end stage, right? It, this is something that's not immature anymore, but has reached maturity. And Paul says some things here that are worth noting in this regard. First of all, in verse 13, we see that I mature together with other church members. And again, when Paul uses that language for maturity, he's describing an adult man. Uh, and here, the language is corporate. In verse 13, uh, one adult man. Corporately, the church grows up to become one mature individual. Are you following me there? So in verse 14, he talks about plural infants. Immature churches are a co collection of immature babies. No offense who wah wah all the time. Are you familiar with infants? They pretty much have a way of uh, making their presence known and insisting on getting their way, right? <clears throat> and Paul says that's what we are not to be. Instead, the church grows together to become one mature individual. We become like an adult, a person who has reached maturity. So the implication is that separately alone, we remain immature or infants. Together, we grow up or we mature into Christ. In verse 13, we also see that our corporate maturity allows us to experience more of Christ. We measure the maturity of our church by nothing less than our corporate Christ-likeness. Which is good news for some of us because the law of averages means that we fare better together than we do individually, right? That was a joke. <laughs> but together, what is our Christ-likeness? What does our church present to the world, especially to this community, in regards to the presence of Christ? How much of Jesus is presence in our midst? So I cannot be content with my own spiritual growth and maturity. That is insufficient. I must long and strive for and contribute to the maturity of my church until we all together more closely resemble Christ. This is not the place to be looking out for my own life and those of my children or my close friends. It is so vital that we pay attention to what is happening for everyone. Because we all grow together into Christ's likeness. In verse 15, we see that our corporate maturity occurs in all things or in every aspect. In other words, we are to be corporately mature, spiritually grown up in every aspect of church life. In every age group that gathers in this church. In everything that is printed, in everything that is said, in everything that is sung, all things done. We are to attain to the fullness of Jesus Christ. So stewardship and business and teaching and caring for one another and worship, all of these things are to reflect our maturity in Christ together or they will reveal our lack of maturity in Christ together. Also in verses 15 through 16, we see that as we mature, love is to characterize all we say and do. In verse 15, Paul says, speak the truth. Uh, and he's referring to the truth about Jesus Christ. The word and the ways of God. We are to speak that to one another. But that is to be spoken in love. Which means that when we interact with one another, the, the net result of those interactions is to, remove, is to move everybody here closer to Jesus Christ. That is acting in love, doing what is best for God's people over time. In verse, 15, verse 16, Paul says the church builds itself up in love. Love is how we evaluate the church's actions. Do our actions result in moving people 
to God's best in the long run. Now, one question that has haunted humanity since the Garden of Eden is the question that all women ask at some point in their lives, and that is, when will men ever grow up? (laughs) So I've done a lot of thinking about this this week. Biologists will tell us that all organisms reach sexual maturity when they are able to reproduce, and in humans, that process takes years to happen. We are not sure why. Human females reach puberty between the ages of 10 and 14, while human males reach puberty between the ages of 12 and 16. And I know that women are thinking, yeah, physical maturity, but when do men actually grow up? When do, we, when do people reach that point that researchers call emotional maturity that distinguishes adulthood? You know, when do we become grown-ups? And so this term, emotional maturity, is important if you're thinking about this subject. It's the ability to understand, manage, and express emotions in a balanced and appropriate way. Our culture thinks that adults ought to be able to do this. This is emotional maturity. It involves several key aspects like self-awareness, emotional regulation. It involves empathy, responsibility, adaptability, and most of all, relationship management. Sooner or later, if you're going to uh, adult in this world, if you're going to go and do that, you have to be able to relate to people. Especially those people. Now, studies show that females reach emotional maturity in their late teens to mid-twenties. Men, however, reach emotional maturity in their late twenties to mid-thirties. That is a huge gap, ladies. A British study in 2013 showed that 80% of the women surveyed believed that men would never stop being childish. Women were twice as likely to believe that they were the grown-up in the relationship. 46% of the women surveyed had a relationship in which they felt like they had to mother their male counterpart. Women claimed that they had to tell their man to act his age an average of 14 times a year. That's more than once a month, men. What are we doing out there? Emotional maturity. I want you to hear what Paul is saying. Believers must also mature and grow up. And that is something we do together in the local church. No one comes to Christ completed. We must all grow up. And what Holy Scripture tells us is that we need one another for that to happen. This is something that happens as we live together as the body of Christ over a long period of time. So the question I'm wanting to ask is, am I experiencing and contributing to how my church is becoming more like Christ in all it says and does? Am I taking seriously, in other words, the spiritual maturity of my church? All right, now let's consider why this is important. We've talked about what it is, now let's answer the why question. So the second thing I want you to see is that God created the process of growth and maturity in the church and how it would be accomplished. Church members working together to accomplish God's purposes with the gifts of the Spirit. So this answers the the why question. Why do I need to take seriously the whole concept of growing to maturity? The answer is because God created this whole process. So in verse 11, we see that God is the one who thought up and implemented the reality that a person and a church both need to grow up and mature. This is God's will for all things, but especially for us as his people. And and Paul tells us it was he or God who gave. Uh, in, In other words, Christ supplies everything necessary to foster growth and maturity in the church. 
And in verses 1 through 7 of chapter 4, we see that God created the unity of the church through the Spirit. And through the Spirit, He distributes gifts and callings. But here, Paul's implication is that the spiritual gifts that God gives us are the people who are sitting around us. And each one of us manifests the Spirit in a wide variety of ways at different times in our lives. But we need each other because no one person completely experiences the fullness of Christ alone the way that we do in the body of Christ. And so the ascended Christ gives to his people people to enable the church to function and develop as it should. This is God's will. And in verse 12, Paul says that Christ bestows gifts of grace to equip the church to accomplish God's purposes and to help the church to grow. People are given by Christ to equip the church, to prepare people in the church, to exercise their spiritual giftedness so that the church can accomplish its mission. And all of this is to build up the church. And so Paul uses construction language here to build something up with the goal to be completed. The language emphasizes or implies growth in size. And so Paul says that God gives to the church apostles and evangelists. These are the people who have the spiritual passion and capacity to reach others with the gospel. Which means that these are the people that help bring more people into the church. But then Paul says the gifts of the Spirit also help the church to grow internally. And that's implied by the mention of the gifts of prophets and pastor teachers. These people uh, are the people who, these are the ones who help those who come into the church to stay in the church and to mature in Christ's likeness. And so the question I want to ask is, what is the role God created me to fill in my local church? How do you understand why God has you in your local church? Do you believe that there is a place that God designed just for you? Now, let's look at how growth may occur in me and in my church. So the third thing I want to tell you is that I contribute to the growth of my church by strengthening my connection to Christ, by strengthening my connection to the members of my church, and by doing my part in the body of Christ. So this answers the question of how I and my church are to grow and mature. This explains how it actually happens. And it has to do with my connection. And how I live that out. So first of all, in verse, 5, verse 16, I see that I must strengthen my connection with Christ. And Christ is the ultimate source of the church's growth. For he supplies all that is necessary for its well-being, including its unity, nourishment, and progress. I may not be able to do anything about your intimacy with Christ, but I can always address my own. And as long as I am becoming intimate with Christ, then I'll be able to contribute to what God is doing collectively in all of us. We also see that I'm connected to the Spirit, with e- connected by the Spirit with every member of my church. Therefore, I must strengthen and maintain that connection. So Paul focuses on the growth of the body, not on the growth of individual members of the body but the growth of the whole body. The point is for all of us to grow, not just me. I grow too, but that is never my focus. What happens to a part of the body that grows exponentially, but out of proportion with the rest of the body? They call that a tumor and they cut it out. And Paul says that's not what the body of Christ is supposed to be like. We are to be so connected together that together we are growing towards Christ's likeness. He says we are joined together and held together. This refers to the the way that the body is knitted together as a unity by the head of the body, Jesus Christ. Since I'm connected to everyone else by God, 
I should, strength to, I should seek to strengthen those connections and not weaken them. And I'm just going to tell you, friend, in my view, strengthening the connections with the members of your church takes will and effort. And I know we all move in certain circles and we uh, associate naturally with the people who move in those circles, but that limits my ability to connect with other people in the church. If I want my church to be unified and if I want to feel like we're all connected, I'm going to have to alter my routines from time to time and talk to people I don't normally speak with. Are you following me there? Okay. Verse 16 also says, I am to fulfill my God-given role in the body of Christ. Every member of the church receives what is needed to perform his or her proper function so that the growth of the whole body is healthy and strong, just as God designed it. So in light of this, Paul says, I should eagerly exercise my gift for the good of the whole. I support and encourage you as you support and encourage me, and then together we are all supported and encouraged to accomplish the mission that God has given to us. Now think again about your own personal growth and maturity. There are things we should be doing to contribute to our physical growth. Isn't that true? Things like get plenty of sleep, eat right, exercise, those sorts of things that we all love, right? Is there anything we can do to contribute to our emotional maturity, to grow up and become adults the way that many researchers describe it? Now, in the British study I mentioned earlier, the women mentioned the top maturity fails of men. In other words, these are the things that men do that do not make them mature, such as finding their own passing of gas and burps of music. Not very mature. Or finding rude words amusing. (laughs) You said duty. I do that all the time. It's not mature. Or trying to beat children at games and sports. I don't have to try. (laughs) Hey, if you want to win, you're going to have to beat me. There's no gimmies in this life. Very mature. Number four, staying silent during an argument. Not being able to cook simple meals. It's ramen noodles, guys. Can you boil water or not? So instead, doctors and psychologists and school counselors suggest doing these kinds of things if you want to grow up emotionally and become an adult. You do things like you're not a bully. You avoid gossip, rumors talking about people behind their backs. You're, you're going to be the bigger person if someone is unkind to you. You keep an open mind and you're eager to learn. You have confidence in yourself. You accept personal responsibility. You take control of what you can. You be sincere and genuine. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. These are the things that help us to attain to adulthood in our culture. And in the same way, Paul is saying that there are things I can do so that I and my church will mature. What are those things? Well, I can draw closer to Jesus Christ each day. I can take deliberate steps to strengthen my connection to the other members of my church. And I can take my God-given place in my church to help me, to help the church accomplish its mission. Now, Too often in our culture, my fear is that our churches are filled with people who have the spiritual depth of preteen boys. And the problem is that we've grown up and we may have even stayed a part of the church, but how many of us have consistently over time done the things to help ourselves and our whole church grow up? And maybe this is what's lacking in churches like ours all across the country, is that corporate responsibility and commitment to one another. And our culture encourages us to look out for ourselves. And I'm absolutely telling you as straight as I can that if we do that, we remain spiritual infants. 
We will not grow up in Christ if I'm only looking out for myself. We must take seriously the corporate nature of how the church experiences the maturity of Christ. And that takes not just good intentions, but action. I must be a part of my local church. So the question I'm wanting to ask is, am I contributing to the maturity of my church by nurturing my own connection with Christ, nurturing my connections with other believers, and doing my part in the body of Christ? So as we wrap this up this morning, I want to invite you to think about a couple of things. First of all, I invite you to make a commitment to being a part of the growth and maturity of your church. Help your church to experience the fullness of Christ and to become more like Christ in all of its words and actions. Secondly, I invite you to contribute to the maturity of your church by nurturing your own relationship to Jesus, nurturing your connections with other church members, and by doing your God-given part in your church. So I'm going to pray and then Matthew will come and lead us in this time of response. While we're singing in just a minute, I wonder if you would take some time to reflect on what God is saying to you about your spiritual growth and maturity and about how you're contributing to the the maturity of your church. While we're singing, you can respond to God's word right where you are. But if you feel led, you can come to the altar and pray. And I'll be standing here if you wanted to come and pray with me. And when this service is over, I'll be out in the foyer for a while. I would love to visit with you about what God is saying to you. But how do you need to respond to the word of the Lord? Let's pray together. Lord, we want to acknowledge that we were not born mature. And every one of us has had to grow up physically, intellectually, emotionally to reach maturity. And when we were born again into your kingdom, we were not born complete. We will be completed on the day that Christ returns at the end of all things. Until then, we are growing. And it's not something we do alone. It's something that we do connected to other believers. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help me and for all of us here to understand what growth is, why we should take this seriously, and how it happens in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would renew my commitment to the spiritual maturity of myself and my family and my church so that together we can experience the fullness of Christ. And now may your spirit move in the lives of those who are here to accomplish your purposes this day. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.